1969, Dale Black had a near-fatal plane crash. Afterwards, he wrote a book which claimed that he had been to heaven and come back again. That began a trend of near-death experience books, which actually culminated most recently in a movie release, a movie version of one of those books that happened this September in 2015 called 90 Minutes in Heaven. There's a whole genre now of such books, and uh, they have been dubbed by the blogger Tim Challies, Heaven Tourism. I love uh, The Onion uh, news site, perhaps you come across that, it's a satirical news site, and uh, it did a press release of one of these books, so-called, right, and it went like this, Charles' description of heaven during near-death experience specifically mentions book deal. <laughs> After one of these uh, real books was later revealed to be entirely made up, John MacArthur said this, a hoax it has nothing to do with Christianity. John Piper said, people ought to stop writing those books. And Randy Alcorn commented, yes, heaven is for real. But we already knew that, didn't we? God's Word told us that all along. And so I asked myself this question. Why is there this desire for, a, as it were, a peep show into the afterlife when we have God's Word before us? I think the answer to that question uh, is uh, best answered in the words of Jam James Boyce. Jim Boyce, late great preacher, 10th Presbyterian Church on the East Coast in Philadelphia. Uh, before he died, he predicted that the issue of the day would be not now the authority of the Bible, but its sufficiency, that the Bible is sufficient for all things, life and death. And I think that prediction has uh, become true the sufficiency of the Bible. For instance, today we know many people buy so-called first-hand accounts of heaven or first-hand accounts of what Jesus is calling them to do, which in my observation usually seems conveniently unrelated to costly central biblical themes like sacrifice or the cross. Uh, the author's personal emotional space instead. Meaningful, perhaps, but not the Bible. <laughs> now, maybe you think, well, so what? Who cares? As long as the themes are positive, as long as they're uplifting in some generic sense, what difference does it make? What difference? You know, who cares? Consider the words of Walter Scott. Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. One thing leads to another. It begins to undermine our confidence if this is the real source of our faith, feelings, what some human says when it's proven not to be accurate. I mean, do we really have nothing more substantial to go on when it comes to what God is saying to us or what life is like after death than a hunch, a nice warm shiver in the liver, you know, a gooey feeling inside? Is our faith in heaven dependent upon the mood of the room, the atmosphere? Whether you ate a good breakfast this morning? You see, when the storm of adversity comes into your life, as it surely will at some point or other, if the house of your faith is built on emotional quicksand, will it stand? And so today, I want us to grasp the Bible's message that because the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, we can have indestructible confidence that our physical bodies we raise from the dead as well. And what I want us to see is this is a game changer once we have this confidence. Because the Spirit who raised Jesus uh, dwells in us, we can have indestructible confidence that our physical bodies will be raised from the dead Two, first, the Spirit dwells in us. Second, our physical bodies will be raised. First, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. And so, verse 11, if 
the Bible says. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, what is this speaking about? Is this the same as that hymn that perhaps some of you know? You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. And if it is the same as that, is the Bible teaching us that our confidence in the afterlife is only based upon a feeling in our heart? And if that were the case, could not someone object, wishing it were so, don't make it so? If wishes were fishes, we'd all be swimming in riches, you know? Is it just a feeling? No, this spirit dwelling within us is not merely a feeling. He is the same power of God who raised Jesus from the dead. So we Christians are like the Easter Sunday tomb with the stone rolled away and the risen Jesus walking inside towards the heaven beyond. We are still in our mortal, tomb-like, frail bodies. But now, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is in us too. That's what's being said. He is in us. Not a feeling. He, a person. You say, well, how can we know this spiritual power is in us for sure? Well, I want you to think along with me as we look at this text. Think with me, for as Socrates put it, I cannot teach anybody anything, I can only make them think. And so to know this power in us, we must understand the word if here in this verse and the word dwell. First the word if. Or understand how we can know for sure this power when we see that this word if here is practically speaking the equivalent of since. So when you say if here, you want a little equal sign, since. Say um, you're taking a group of children downtown to Chicago on the train. There are 15 of them or so, it's just you. Joy, oh joys, what a good day. And uh, one of the children inevitably in that lovely, so gorgeous, whiny voice that children have after they've been traveling for about three and a half minutes shouts out, are we nearly there yet? And if you responded as Paul writes here, you would say, if we are on a train to Chicago, then we are certainly going to arrive in Chicago. If equals since. It's grounding the children's confidence in something they know is true. You, they both know that they are on a train, and therefore you are giving them confidence they will arrive, all other things being equal, in Chicago. Right? So similarly here, much, much more so, if the Spirit dwells within you, as we know is the case for those who believe in Jesus, then this other resurrection power also is yours. And so we can know the power of the resurrection in us by understanding this word if equals, equals since. You do not need a first-hand account of a supposed tourist visit to heaven since, if you believe in Jesus, you have the one who rose from the dead in you, even when you don't feel like it. If equals since. Well, there's also this word dwell and it means a permanent home, not a momentary guest. Dwell is temple language. God dwells in us. He will not now ever depart. Now, I believe the significance of this meaning of dwelling as permanent home is best told by the story of early church leader Augustine. Augustine was not always religious, uh, he was intellectually brilliant, a debater for the anti-Christian philosophy, um, known at the time as Manichaeanism. He was a defender of the good life, doing whatever you want, living the Roman dream, you see. In fact, uh, we know that Augustine sends away one mistress, forcing her to give up her son, to have an arranged marriage with a 10-year-old, two years before the legal age at the time, and so hence Augustine adopts a another mistress for a while. This is the kind of life he's living. 
But one day, Augustine observed a beggar on the street celebrating raucously simply because the beggar had had a good meal. And Augustine suddenly realized that despite all his great fame and success, the beggar was happier than he was. <laughs> it made Augustine ask a number of questions. What on earth was he here for? Perhaps you're asking that question. Perhaps you have great riches and success, and you, you notice someone on the streets in Chicago, and they look pretty happy. Augustine began to realize that in the inner workings of his mind, there was a ticking truth, an itch that would not go away. He was made for eternity. Our hearts, he said, are restless until they find their rest in thee. And so perhaps you can hear that message. You put your trust in Jesus. And now, according to Paul, inside you have immediate access to the risen power that raised Jesus from the dead, dwelling in you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. You realize you're made for eternity, but now also the power of eternity is in you and will not be taken away. Now, Sometimes, if uh, we are honest together, as we must always be when we look at the Bible, you and I do not always experience that powerful reality. It can seem muted, even absent, we fear. Sometimes we turn up the noise of the distractions of our life so loud we almost drown out the music of the Spirit within. This is a Christian experience, so-called desert times. But then, on other occasions, it is also true the sweetness of the Spirit can make life pleasant, even in the midst of the most painful sufferings. For we have a foretaste of the banquet of heaven, And then, whichever of those we're experiencing right now, wherever we are on that uh, experiential spectrum, at all times, <laughs> the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us and will not be taken away. How can we know? Because we have God's sure and certain word as guarantee. And so you, perhaps you take a walk outside late at night in one of these beautiful autumn, fall evenings and you look up at the night sky and you're just in awe as you look at all the different stars. Or if you're an atheist, the awe is loneliness in this vast, cold universe. If you're a theist, the awe is somewhere someone made all this. But if you're a Christian, the awe is that the one who created all that and whose newly creative power raised Jesus from the dead in a brilliant Easter Sunday moment dwells in you. And so to look at this text and say, oh, it's just subjective emotions, is it's missing the point. Let me try and explain that this way. Scientists know that sight and hearing is perceived in the brain, right? You, the light goes through your eyeballs, the sound through your eardrum, but it's perceived in the brain. And so it's possible theoretically, 
to doubt the reality of such sense perception because you're perceiving it in the brain. But we do not. Why? Because that's the route to madness, right? Similarly, for the Christian, the presence of Jesus is a constant, evident presence that you can doubt, but at the same time, it's a bit like when you see the color yellow. You just know it's yellow. Now, of course, this uh, text here needs to be put in the context of the Bible's broader teaching about the certainty of our resurrection. We have many other reasons to believe in the resurrection, the Bible tells us. We have the evidence of eyewitness. We have uh, the evidence of history, that if Christ was not raised from the dead, what else can account for the miraculous growth of the New Testament church? No historian has come up with a counter um, explanation. We even have the evidence of true reason in the Bible's worldview. The resurrection of Jesus is not just a random miracle, you know, without explanation, as if God's just going to do something weird at any moment. No, it's a breaking in, according to God's plan, of His other kingdom into a spiritually two-dimensional world. Not, not a violation of the laws of science, no, any more than... Um, an author writing in himself into a story, or Alfred Hitchcock appearing in one of his movies is a violation of the laws of movie making. God writes himself into the story. But here, and most constantly unavoidable for the Christian, immediately accessible, the power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us. Here's an image that you might find helpful. We are like a chrysalis. They look pretty ugly when you observe them from the outside. But there's a butterfly within. And one day, there'll be a full revelation of the power that raised Jesus in the resurrection of your physical body, if you believe. Because the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. We can have indestructible confidence that our physical bodies will be raised from the dead as well, which is extraordinarily good news and is also a life-changer, game-changer. So first, the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells within us, and that means that one day our physical bodies will be raised. That, I want to show you, is a complete game-changer for how we live today. Now, listen to what the Bible says again. The Bible says, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So this is hope of the future but it's the kind of definite, sure hope, and it is not a disembodied existence like a ghost, but a physical, bodily resurrection. So Paul uses this word mortal because not just that we are physical, but he's indicating that while originally we are made in God's image, the physical, including the brain, is now, because of the fall, subject to decay. We're mortal. But now in Christ, this definite sure hope is not just that we will flit around like a ghost, but that our bodies will be raised. That's an extraordinary thought. It requires renewed defense in our day, as well as increased application, because it is a game changer. Now, when I say renewed defense, actually, life after death on it itself alone, that idea of life after death alone, requires very little defense. Um, here's one example. Professor Sue Black, a real-life CSI expert, as far as I know, not a believer in Jesus, professor of anatomy, forensic anthropology, she said this, someone who's seen a lot of death, she said this, I've been fortunate enough to be at the moment of death with both my mother-in-law and my own father and to be there to hold their hand when they take that last breath. And the shift that happens in that last breath from being the person you know to there being something gone missing is like a light going out. 
it seems as if it's the common human intuition that the grave is not the end. In fact, according to Duke University Professor Mark Chavez, contemporary surveys show that as many Americans believe in heaven as they did decades ago, 86% of Americans believe in heaven today. Slightly less believe in hell, but still a massive majority, 73% believe in hell. So probably then, most of us here today believe that something will happen to us after we die. Few here would agree with atheist Bertram Russell that when we die, we rot. But what most definitely does require renewed defense in our day is the physicality the bodily nature of our resurrection with, specifically, Jesus. Many today think of life after death as nothing more than disembodied ghosts, like nearly headless Nick in Harry Potter novels, sort of floating around and going through walls and just on the other side of the door. Even heaven tourism books tell us of pearly gates, streets literally paved with gold, and they describe scenes of peace and joy. But they usually have little of the reality that the focal point of heaven is not the presence of our best friends, nor human tastes and pleasures. It's the person of Jesus with whom we will be and see and touch. John Piper said, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this, if you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ was not there? Well, not the believer. The believer knows the real heaven is much, much better than the make-believe heaven. We will be with Christ, and that will be more than enough. If you believe John the Apostle's vision in Revelation, at the center of heaven is the glorious presence of the Lamb of God Himself, Jesus. And those of the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, within them will be satisfied with that vision. They will be not just satisfied, they will delight endlessly in exploring the love of their lives and the joy of their hearts and the profundity of the renewed mind and body that they have with Christ as they're raised physically as He was raised. So someone says to you, that's all pie in the sky. You say, no. It's more like a marriage. I already have a relationship with him, and then I will know him fully as I am fully known. Renewed defense in our day, the physical resurrection, but it is, as I said at the beginning, a game changer as we apply it to our lives. And I've been doing that to myself in three areas, and I share them with all of us now, our money, our minds, and the sense of what it is to be an individual me, our money. I came across as a new initiative from Silicon Valley, billionaires are seeking to end mortality by investing huge amounts of money into the same techniques that led to the digital revolution, now to the human body, so we would live forever here, or at least greatly extend our lives. When I came across this, it immediately reminded me of a 1970s movie about three celebrity women who drunk from the fount of eternal youth. What no one ever told them was that while they would live forever, each time they got injured, they would still be injured. And so, bit by bit, they pick up scars and broken bones and cuts, and the final scene 
is of a person after a car accident, body parts everywhere, and a little voice still talking in a self-obsessed way from a minuscule part of the body bouncing down the road. Not a movie that pastorally I would recommend, <laughs> but it makes the point. Surely such existence is closer to a hell of our own making. Who wants to live on in perpetual pain when others have died, when our physical bodies have broken bones that cannot fit, be fixed? What a waste of money. I like the joke from the former comedian Robin Williams who said that cocaine is God's way of telling you that you're making too much money. What a waste of money. Billions spent on the fount of youth. It's been tried before, guys. It's misguided. The unreality of Instagram, perfect lives writ large. Instead, follow Jesus' advice and invest our money in heaven's bank by being generous with our resources for the sake of the kingdom of God. Money, our minds and our bodies. The physically disabled will have a glorious new resurrection body. Our stars ministry. There'll be a glorious new resurrection body for those who believe in Jesus. And that healing will extend to brain as well as body. It is estimated that one in five Americans will experience a mental illness in their lifetime. A Christian was speaking at a conference about her experience of hospitalization for mental illness some years ago. She obtained her medical records afterwards and she noticed that the admitting physician had recorded that she was clearly delusional because she thinks she knows God. She said that knowing God was all she knew at that time in her life. Perhaps that's you. What you know is a foretaste of heaven. There will be no depression in heaven. No broken, diseased bodies either. You say, well, that's the future. What about now? Well, that future can alleviate sorrow now. Samuel Johnson said that sorrow is the state of mind in which our desires are fixed upon the past. So here comes the hope of heaven. It gives us power. It gives power to the hurting. There's a future to fix our minds upon when we read the Bible where there'll be no loss no sadness. Do you want that? But this vision of heaven also applies to our sense of being an individual in this individualistic age in which we live. Psychologists have what is called a narcissism test. One reporter records that the median, one of the versions of average, the median narcissism score has risen 30% in the last two decades. In other words, we have an epidemic of narcissism. But why not? If this is all there is, and if what is to come is as unappetizing as playing a harp on a celestial cloud, then why not eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die? There was a Gallup poll in 1950 that asked high school seniors if they considered themselves a very important person. 12% said yes. The same poll was asked in 2005. Guess how many people thought in 2005 that they were a very important person? 80%. So we, we, we need a dream of something better, something bigger to live for, then this, as one author put it, the big me. That's why we're fixated on fame, our 10 minutes on television, or whatever it is, or our reputation. There's nothing bigger to live for. 
And so, you know, we think we're always right, even when others disagree, and we trample on others' viewpoints. We're like the madman in G.K. Chesterton's book, Orthodoxy, who is so obsessed by the one thing of himself that he relates all other things to that one thing, and through distorted reason becomes a crazed conspiracy theorist. We condemn others because uh, they do not fit into our preferences. We, we cannot submit to others because they don't think the way that we would think. We complain about our wife or our husband because she doesn't think like us. Of course she doesn't think like you. She's not you. We're criticized. Our ego is so delicately founded on nothing but the self that it cannot handle the necessary character training that can only come from iron, sharpening iron, from another person. Our lives shrink smaller and smaller until we're trapped in a hell of nothing but me. And here comes this vision of heaven. It's the antidote to this individualistic me. For now, each whisper of my personal desire... The heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Each whisper of my personal desire is a message of the one above all to be desired, the one in whom and with whom we will, if we believe, be raised physically from the dead to glory in him, not me. Chris Wright put it like this, when God reigns, there will be peace, life will be good we will be saved. So here's that vision of the coming kingdom. It makes us orient our individualistic me around him. It's a bit like how Alice in the book Alice in Wonderland has to get really, really small to enter Wonderland. And then our physical bodies we raise in that true heaven. And that means right now we can say no to a thousand things for the sake of saying yes to that one great, glorious, unending thing. We're freed from the tyranny of self by this perspective of eternity. We're freed from the ghostly fear that we must get our sensual experiences now by the sure and certain physical resurrection, not just of our souls, but our bodies. And so our poem is no longer, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. No, he is my master. And I live for him. For within us now, if we believe, is the presence of God himself. The Spirit dwells in us, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And if we have the Spirit, we can know we will be raised physically too. Of course, I like to make jokes about life after death, like the best of you. Here's one of my favorites. There's a politician and a cab driver who die at the same time. They're in the taxi. The taxi is in a wreck. They both die. And at the gate of heaven, St. Peter hands the politician a small set of white wings, but the uh, cabby driver gets a very large set of golden wings. Why is that, the politician says, you know, so much for public service, that kind of thing. Why does the cabbie get a large set of golden wings and I get this puny kind of little white wings? Why is that? St. Peter replies, while you were campaigning, people were voting, but while he was driving, people were praying a lot. You know, there are those who have gone to heaven and come back again. Paul, actually, who was not permitted to speak of his mysterious experience of heaven. And Jesus, witnessed by the word, the Spirit of God who raised him from the dead within you, if you believe. Would you put your trust in Jesus for this future vision of glory with him? It is not a fiction. It is not a fable. It is not a mere feeling. 
power that raised Christ from the dead. And so, because the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, we can have indestructible confidence that our physical bodies will be raised from the dead too. Let us pray. Lord, uh, we are all individuals, and each of us look out through our own eyes and hear things through our own ears and are inevitably shaped by our individual reality. And yet, Lord, for those of us who believe, we have another reality within the very Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. Lord, I pray for those here this morning who don't yet know you, whose hearts are restless. Would you, by your Holy Spirit, cause them to find their rest in you? And I pray for all of us, Lord, that with this indestructible confidence, we would now live lives of generosity, of joy, and of service. We pray it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.